a Living History production. I'm Peter Hart. And I'm Gary Bain. And together we're Pete and Gary's Military History Podcast. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Good morning, good morning. We've danced the whole night through. Good morning. We've stanced the whole night through. I'm taking this stance all night. (laughs) I love taking a stance. (laughs) Anyway, hello, Gary. Uh, uh, I'm Peter Hart. You're Gary. I seem to have got the wrong teeth in again today. So I like a good start to a podcast, he he said. So, uh, so Gary, you'd better say what we're doing as I can't seem to speak at all. Well, today, Pete, we're continuing in the series of uh, podcasts uh, surrounding the uh, the Somme. And as we said previously, we're not going to concentrate just on the 1st of July. We're actually going to do a series that runs right the way through. Um, so people might be asking, well, why are you doing something now then? Well, we're going to do Somme Preparations 1916 today, Pete. And that follows on and on the planning one that we did, which went through the whole planning process and how they got to where they were. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sounds a good idea to me. I hope we've got some notes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about when you suggested we do this is is just have a think about the sorts of things that you and I need in our everyday lives just to get through the day. Beer. Beer. Clothes, sometimes. Uh-huh. More beer. <laughs> <laughs> that's about it really isn't it beer and clothes beer and clothes that's us sorted but just have a think about oh, it salted peanuts you know rations uh, health care dentistry um, all the things you're going to need and then multiply that by hundreds of thousands for the men on the western front it's going to be a big job and actually you've led us into where we're going to start because people think when planning a battle that they often leave logistics till last when they're talking about it. Well, we're not doing that. We're going to start with logistics. We have been influenced by Rob Thompson, the guru. Guru, 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 guru. guru. Rob Thompson, the guru. He ain't. Gorgeous sex, God. He is. But, yeah, I mean, he puts logistics front and centre, doesn't he? He Every does. Every time. But do you know war? I mean, war, modern warfare, nineteen sixteen. It's just bloody impossible without uh, without a thorough grasp of the theory and practice of log- of the science, if you like, of logistics, um, and uh, not the geography of logistics. I oh, wouldn't. No, no, geography's not my strong point. <laughs> and and uh, so it's it's not something you start in June for an offensive in July, is it? The first of July. Uh, so early in nineteen sixteen, you've got the head quarter staff of Fourth Army uh, and, and the whole of the BEF, uh, but the Fourth Army though they've they've got the awesome task of, of deploying some four hundred thousand men, well over a thousand guns, hundred thousand horses, yay! Some of whom have got their own teeth. <laughs> um, uh, ready. So uh, you know this has all got to be put forward for, and this battle the battle of the somme is right at the center of the allied plans it, it, you know it, it it's not just on the western front it's also it's coordinated with offenses on the russian front uh, on the italian front uh, and everywhere you can think of so what's the somme area like is it like a big concreted area that's ideal for a, a gathering of logistics no it's basically next to the french and i think that's the only thing that joff the french commander in chief had in mind we did discuss that but it's it's agricultural by nature it still is really isn't it, it is. um it's it's it had in 1916 it had almost no modern rail, road and rail network there, there, there's no infrastructure at all for for this kind of deployment and it's a bloody nightmare for the for the logistical planners uh, it, they, they've got to, they've got to you know before they can start they've almost got to create an infrastructure from scratch and you worked in uh, in in the railway systems uh, the, the transport for london and it <laughs> Well, what do you think of the rail system that existed? What what sort of problems exist in the in the railway network that linking Albert, that's the deployment point, if you like, to the rest of the rail, the, the very good rail system in France? What about that bit of it? 
Well, the, the obvious thing is, is only freight trains had anything like the physical capability to move the quantities, huge quantities, that were required for a, an offensive, given the time scales, Pete. So, so um, what are we talking about? How many? Well, the staff officers, they calculated that every single day, the 4th Army would need 14 trains to carry ammunition. So that's bangy things. Yeah. A further 11 trains for supplies. Now, that could be anything. You know, that could be rations through uniforms, anything. And six trains to carry the reinforcements, horses and general stores. Now, this meant that in all, some 31 trains per day were needed just to service the 4th Army. Now, what about when the actual offensive starts? So how much, well, well that, they reckoned that... then that it, that would increase to uh, about 70 trains. So we need, we need generally, we need just over 30 trains a day, and when the offensive starts, we need uh, 70. So uh, tell me about the two railway lines. That's, and let's uh... not forget, Pete, not only are you taking things up, once the offensive begins, you've got the wounded, you've got to get them away. So it, it's an incredible logistical problem that they're battling with. So what are the railways like? What, what are they, sir? Well, there, there were only two lines that served the Alberta area, and one of these was... Uh, uh, inconveniently, a non-standard gauge, typically oh. typically helpful. Um, so it's obvious that something drastic would have to be done. So what was done? Well, what, what, I mean, and what is the scale of what they're going to do? You you worked in contracts, so they decide to. Well, I'll will I'll, I'll set it up for you. They decide to construct two new standard gauge lines, um, and with with the associated railheads for for uh, the battlefront. Uh, that they're also going to provide rail spurs and loads of sidings to service the various ammunition and supply depots. Uh, well, expand the stations and the rest of it. Now, how big a job, from your experience at TFL, is this? How much would it? How much work would it be to put a new, say, Southern line in to service Bromley with all the associated spurs, depots, and everything else? Would you be able to do that in four or five months? I hate spurs. <laughs> I'm going to answer that with one word, crossrail. How late is crossrail? Don't know. How much is the overrun Aren't on Aren't you responsible for crossrail? No, well, I wasn't. <laughs> so it, it's, you know, it's not easy, even with today's modern equipment, with, uh, uh, you know, complete access to the railway. And then let's not forget, once you've done it, you've got to maintain it. So, so, so it's this is for for to do it in what six months? It's incredible. In fact, it's got to be done in much shorter time than that. It, it's it's a huge, massive undertaking. Um, now, even that's not the full scope because they, they're going to put in light railway system. What what, are, what normally well, Deckerville, but I believe there are others. Uh, for for people who don't know what a Deckerville railway is, that if you used to go on a, to- a children's railway when you were young, they were often First World War Deckerville tracks. I think it's not the case now. Um, yeah, well, the idea with those is to get as close to the front as you possibly can. Now, they didn't go all the way to the front, but they got you as close as possible. So they go from the railheads for the big railway to to as far as, as close as they could get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so a huge amount of work to be done on the railway system. What about the roads? What, what state were they in, do you think? Well, there were a few uh, metal roads, uh, which we would refer to as main roads, I suppose. Um, But they weren't constructed to a sufficiently stringent standard, and and they began to break up. I mean, the the level of traffic that they were having to cope with. Now, what sort of problem are we talking about? Is is this things like the the big guns, uh, heavy artillery... uh or just the wagon. It's just anything. It's just it? anything, and and even troops, you know, marching up and down these roads. The roads were not designed for the level of traffic that they were taking. Now, now that's the main roads. That's the main roads. The so, side roads, they're they're basically little more than rough tracks, and and they became so muddy that they were all but indistinguishable from the fields. Oh. You didn't think <laughs> I could say the word indistinguishable, did I you? I thought you could say it. I was a bit worried about stringent. Or fields. <laughs> They've got to improve and widen the roads from the railheads. Um, what about bridges? I mean, are bridges in a rural area built to withstand the sort of weight of a sort of massive, great, bangy thing? No. So you've got to strengthen the bridges. You've got to identify all of this as well, Pete. That's part of the logistics. You can't just you know, have somebody turn up and say, oh, God, we should have done this bridge. 
So you've got to do this well in advance. You've got to have a widespread program of road construction. And there's a problem there. What's the problem with a widespread program of road construction? If you think about it, what is the problem? Well, how are you going to get the material forward that you need to do the roads? Well, you're going to use a railway. So that's putting an increased burden on the railway. And they're already struggling. Because the roads need enormous amounts of, of raw material, stone basically, foundations, and then all the tarmac at them and everything else, you know. So, in in fact, what happens is they only they settle for patchwork repairs. Uh, when the road surface collapsed, they repaired it. So it's basically like modern roads in this country. They're just patched until someone actually complains who's got some authority. Um, now, uh, what about behind the line? Um, how did the small... I mean, it's dotted with small villages, farms, you know, the occasional small town, isn't it? Uh, how They'd struggle, wouldn't they, in peacetime to, to bill it... The, 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 a sort of army units coming into the area. How do you think they cope with nigh on half a million men? Well, they get swamped and, uh, you know, you get bivouacs, tents and huts. They're the obvious answer. And you, you'd get these huge imposing camps that were soon erected all around the villages and woods. So the villages effectively became military towns. Now, you've got a quote from Sergeant Frank Ancham of the 97th Field Company, Royal Engineers. And this is quite interesting because it shows the sort of work that's going on just to set, just to set up the billets for the troops, never mind the roads and everything else. Come on, then, Frank, tell me all about it. The billets consisted of one large barn with a large and absolutely barren field. Within a fortnight, Major Philpots had made comfortable beds of timber and wire netting for everyone, cookhouses and stables. At the lower end of the yard, uh, at the lower end off the yard, he had improvised a band saw, two circular saws, a drilling machine, lathe and grindstone, all driven from one shaft by two 10 horsepower steam engines and a small petrol engine, and at very little cost for practic practically all the machinery was salvaged from damaged French factories at Albert. Stolen. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a party of men worked in the woods, which lie close to Ville in the Ancre marshes cutting down suitable trees and lopping off branches. A pair of horses dragged the trees to the workshop, where another party of men barked them, and they were then lifted by the crane, another homemade patent of the majors, up to the bandsaw. From there to the circular saws, cut to the required size and loaded straight onto the wagons, which were parked within a few feet and up the line the same night. Well, they were lucky to have Major Philpot from the sound of that. Yeah, but it just shows how much work. That's just getting the wood for the billets and also the wood for the front line, of course, the need for revetting and things. It's a hell of a thing. Now, one big problem is, is water. Why is that a problem? Why could water be a problem? There's plenty of water in that area, surely. Yeah, but the, the water supplies that were there, they were adequate for the existing population. So you start moving in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men and they're, they're soon overwhelmed by demand. Because they're thirsty, aren't they? Yeah, it's not only thirst. Thirsty men also need water to wash. And uh, the thousands of horses, they seem to drink their own body weight in water on a regular basis. You seem to drink your own body weight in I beer. Eat, I eat my own body weight. <laughs> All right, that's um, right. But even lorries, you know, lorries have radiators. What do radiators need? Oil. Water. <laughs> I'm not very technical. <laughs> so there is a huge demand. <laughs> so uh, what can they do about that? What sort of work are we talking Well, uh, they've got to dig new wells. Um, but that then there's only so much you know an aquifer, the, and the French have got their eye on this. They're going, yeah, <laughs> they've they've got to install pumping equipment. But again, that pumps out the water supplies, miles of piping to get it to the right place, uh, and and then high capacity water points, uh, you know, as near as possible to the front lines, uh, where of course they can be disrupted by German shelling, I suppose. Uh, so what would you, how would you basically sum this up? Well, you're basically putting in a huge monumental effort trying to drag a rural French countryside in the Somme Valley into the 20th century. Just ready to be smashed a bit. <laughs> Just in time to be smashed to pieces. By yes. the opposing artillery of both sides. I like that idea. 
Um, now, even moving the infantry and guns up is, is, is a nightmare, isn't it? Now, this people think, oh, well, we'll move the such and such division up. But they take, each division takes so much of road. Each gun battery takes up so much of each, you know. So what are the problems on the road? Well, what do you have to do to the roads to get ready for this? Not well, just, I'm not talking about the surface now. No, I'm no, no. For one thing, you've got to assign roads for the move. You've so got to. In, out. In, out. You've got to, to have signposts erected. People, you know, have got to know where they're expected to be heading. You've got control posts uh, established at major crossroads, and you had military police there trying to control the traffic um, because you've got hundreds of thousands of people. The roads were packed. Absolutely packed, weren't they? Um, and what sort of stuff? So we've got, we've got, the, uh, and this is where we mentioned they'll get churned up. Dirty, great big howitzers, aren't they? Churning up. Uh, even a tarmac Adam Road can be churned up. You can see this when a big lorry goes into a in, into a side street. They they actually tear up the uh, the, the tarmac Adam. Uh, oh, and and a lot of it isn't tarmac Adam. It's uh, what you call it, parve. Um, uh, big stony things, aren't they? Yeah, parve. And what about traffic jams? You think they have traffic jams? Well, of course they do. You've got tail to tail convoys of of motor traffic. You've got horse transport and a, a myriad variety. It's not. You know, just it could be anything, uh, and of course you've got an endless column of infantry. Dum drum dum drum drum dum dum drum. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're now going to be uh, Lieutenant William Bluer of C Battery, One Four Ninth Brigade, Royal Field Artillery. He's a, he's quite a character. Bluer. What does he say? The whole of the roads for the five miles I travelled were filled with artillery, infantry, motor lorries ration carts, ammunition wagons, etc. in one unbroken line, going up to the lines full and being met by a similar continuous stream of empty vehicles returning, like Oliver Twist for more. Blocks were frequent and it took me over two hours to get to Ettenheim. I estimated I saw not less than 3,000 vehicles, all with six horse teams. No Lord Mayor's show was in it at all. It sounds. Good. Uh, I had a Lord Mayor show. <laughs> yes, didn't the Lord Mayor show always leave uh, horse manure? <laughs> Possibly, uh, especially with our current. Oh no, 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 no. Now, so delays, traffic jams, confusion. But you know what? Despite that, thanks to the work of a lot of people and everything, it it works relatively smoothly, doesn't it? Uh, so, so, so that's part of the logistics stuff. Now, let's talk about the preparations for e for, for. It's the a good job it did, Pete, because otherwise they'd have had to have called the whole thing off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> might have been good for the infantry. We're going to yeah. look at now. Um, it, it, whether you, people often seem to think that your job's done when you've recruited. You know, you've you've got K one, K two, K three, K four, K five. You've got all these hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Is that the end of the problem? Recruiting them, do you reckon? No, you, I mean, you've got to turn them into soldiers, Peter. You, they've got to be capable of meeting the, <laughs> the uh, relatively well-trained <laughs> oh, Germans in Germans. battle. I tell you. <laughs> now, it's not only that, is it? You, you're lacking variously officers. NCOs, uniforms. Trained officers and NCOs. Yeah, yeah. This is what you mean, isn't it? The, yeah. you're, you're lacking men with the experience to, to take train them, other men. And to take command in, in extremely stressful situations. It's not yeah. only that, you're missing kit. Modern weapons, you know, you see pictures of them practicing drill in their civilian clothes carrying broomsticks. Um, the most, ba most basic accommodation for the men. This is a desperate situation. That's back in England. We're sorry, I, I should have made that clear when I was uh, thinking. The accommodation at the front is a problem. The accommodation back home in England where they're being trained is a huge problem. Yeah. And you, they're, they're all over the place across England. Uh, and who do they, and, and there's a shortage of pers experienced or and or um, skilled personnel of all kinds. Uh, and, and, and so what do they do? What do they do? Well, they, they, they dig out, for want of a better word, uh, a lot of old officers and NCOs, and they're called back to the colours to, to, to drill the ranks into some sort of semblance of discipline. But surely if they're dug out, then they're not exactly up to date, are they? If they've been out of the army for 10, 15... Some of these are Boer War veterans, aren't they? So, so... They are, and, and, and with these quickly uh, amassed and, and ramshackle legions, the old British boasts of the quality rather than quantity of their army, it, it's now starting to rebound against them, well, isn't it? Well, this because is, this is, they're going here for quantity, not quality, definitely. Um, how do they contrast, do you think, to 
and not all, uh, these are generalizations to the bulk of that, the, the main the, the main force of the German army. How does our training compare with that? Well, it, it, by comparison, our training is rushed. Uh, it lacks any depth or detail, and it's often irrelevant to the real needs of the troops in modern conditions of trench warfare. Right. Uh, so when, when they've been trained back home, which is basic training and not in any way sophisticated, when they come out to the Western Front, they're attached uh, to regular battalions serving in the line. So a battalion would come out and they'd be attached to a regular battalion. Now, this was this was described as an easy introduction to the war. You know, this was designed uh, to give them practical experience under a very close supervision in the uh, often strange routines. And, oh, they are, aren't they? And learning that, dangers of trench life. Oh, put your head up and have a look. No. You, well, you can. And some did and some died. Yeah. Um, there's lots of dangers, lots of things you have to learn. Uh, so then, you know, having come in, they'd then serve, uh, probably as a whole division, would move into a quiet area and it would be responsible for a quiet area. Things like Plug Street, which had been murder, but now were quiet areas. You often hear Plug Street mentioned as a, a first uh, area. Um, for most of them, though, this, the Somme, the upcoming Somme battle, that's going to be their first baptism of fire, isn't it? The first real, I mean, they'll have been in the line. This is going to be the first time they're in a real scrap, isn't it? It is, and and the, the training that they require, it, it never really finishes, Pete. They, when they're out of the line after a couple of days' rest, all units would resume a programme of individual training. Now, that was designed to uh, reinforce the basic military skills and to prepare them for the imminent offensive. Now, have we talked we discussed this earlier when we talked about the planning. Haig didn't want to go into action until August at the earliest because he felt his armies weren't trained. But they were doing their best to catch up to try and get the men trained. But the Somme, the 1st of July is very early, isn't it? Yeah, but it was uh, uh, it was because the French required that support and, and Joffre had put a lot of pressure on the British to commit to the earlier date. So there we go. I mean, uh, alliance warfare, isn't it? Uh, it is. Now, uh, so the other thing is, it's not just training them in, 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 in the basic weapons. There's new weapons coming. Uh, now, I'll do the first one because it's the one that uh, I really have come to become known throughout the the, the world as my, for my expertise in it. And that's the Lewis gun. It's a light gun. It weighs about 26 pounds. And do you know what? The drums, each drum, Gary, would fire 47, had 47 rounds in. 47. Oh, I, I, I was led to believe, Pete, that it was between 41 and 47 on various yeah. occasions. <laughs> 49 I've gone for in the past as well. No, 47 it is. And it, it, it has a range of about 2,000, an effective range of about 2,000 yards. What does it give? To the infantry, uh, do you think what what is its great? Well, it's a light benefit? machine gun, and it and it it gives the infantrymen a, a greatly increased firepower as they move forward. Now, that's something that they hadn't had previously. So, it, what we're saying here is, yeah, they're untrained and can't fire fifteen rounds a minute. Uh, but bugger, fifteen rounds a minute when you can fire, you've got a Lewis gun that, that, that's got a much faster rate of fire. So it's it's improving the overall firepower that you've got. But there's something else that's coming along, uh, something else that massively increases the firepower available within an infantry or or at the call, beck and call of an infantry battalion. What's that? Well, the the emergence of trench warfare. If you think about it. Uh, it led to a demand for a simple short-range mortar, and that's so that you could throw a shell upwards and across the short divide of no man's land. And then it would fall. It would fall, and hopefully it would fall on the trench opposite. Now, there was none of these at the start. There were homemade various varieties, but but, but one emerges that, that, that well, it's a three-inch mortar. That, that Do you know what? I'm not sure you wouldn't have been trained on the three-inch mortar. I think Stokes I was. mortar, yeah, I think I was. Uh, and it doesn't change much until the 70s. Uh, Stokes Mortar, fantastic weapon. Uh, and it provides the infantry with, in a sense, their own artillery. But it's quite new at this time. Uh, it's coming in. Uh, there's another weapon that uh, came at the end of 15 uh, and was by then 16 in. What's that? Well, you mentioned that there'd, there'd been improvisation up to this point. But another important weapon that they had to master was the hand grenade, as we would recognise it. And by 1916, the army had settled on the mass-produced Mills bomb, which was a reliable fragmentation grenade. Not necessarily the best, 
but it no. was the one that they could manufacture. It's the one they chose, and they had to train everybody in that. Uh, uh, something else uh, that, that they have to learn, the troops have to learn, uh, and this is a, they have to learn how to defend themselves against it, and that's gas. Since the uh, the uh, second battle of Ypres, it was obvious that they had to learn how to put their gas mask on. Now that was which which gas? Now that's the pH gas mask, isn't it? That's the one that they all go through and yes. in the traditional British fashion. Um, now you've got to get that on properly because if you don't, you die. Ooh. Simple as that. The quick and the dead. Yeah. Quick and the dead. Um, so they've all got all these skills to do, and uh, and one, they've got the personal skills, but personal skills aren't enough. And this is where we really start to fall down. What else do you have to learn? Well, you've got to learn uh, a program of tactical exercises. You know, that's that's designed to try and get them ready for what what's going to face them when they went over the top. Now, most men. They're keen to learn. They're recognising perhaps that they need all the help they could get. And you're going to to do a quote from Brigadier General F.C. Stanley of uh, HQ 89th Brigade. Frederick Stanley, yeah. Lord Derby, I think he is. I'm not quite... Yeah, he is Lord Derby. Uh, This is what he said. "Ah, we, We moved back for our training for the big push, full of enthusiasm, which carries one a long way. This training business was infinitely harder work than being in the line. There was no rest all day and far into the night for a good many of us. We dug, uh, I suppose, from 6,000 to 7,000 yards of trenches. Of course, not to full depth, but enough to show what it looked like. Here we practised every day, getting every man to know exactly what was required of him and what the ground would look like on the, the day. They all tumbled to it very fairly well. Very fairly well. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and certainly our practice improved all of us very much indeed. But there's, why, uh, uh, there's something wrong with this, though. That well, what, 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 what is wrong with the training programme in 1916? Well, it, it's, it's in no way realistic is it there's there's no live firing from fixed line machine guns there's no deafening explosive detonations to to try to recreate the sheer shock and awe of war uh such training concepts just haven't been developed in 1916 they hadn't it's interesting for all the the, the i mean various people will boast oh, our country was the first to invent briefing on the battlefield thing and you hear this going right the way through into 17 but they were already practicing and trying to train everybody on the ground but you're right training on the ground or you know similar things learning your role but without huge explosions without people firing machine guns over yet uh, yeah it's re- you know that's not to say that they weren't trying to do everything possible at the time at the time uh, but the, it, you've mentioned it earlier. The chronic lack of experience meant to train the hundreds of thousands of, of raw youths. They are raw as well, aren't they? It meant that in reality, there was small chance of turning this vast conglomeration. Well, yeah, a conglomeration of office workers, pitmen. Factory workers, farm labourers. You didn't mention uh, bus or train drivers, I noticed. No, most of them were in reserved occupations, of course. <laughs> But you're trying to turn them into hard-bitten soldiers. I'm not sure that's going to work it's, quite it, so quickly. It takes longer. Um, overall, I think our view is that the Territorial and New Army Divisions, they're, they're promising material, aren't they? They're volunteers. They're all volunteers. Um, but they haven't got the, 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 the battle experience. They haven't experienced the sure, sort of sheer intensity of, 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 of war. Uh, what about the regular divisions? They must have experienced the sheer intensity of war. Well, they must have done, mustn't they? Yeah, well, they have. And by 1916, they're regular in name only. They they too were filled with raw recruits as uh, the original ranks were, for the most part, either dead or still recovering from wounds or indeed acting as instructors. Yeah, they've been used, to, yeah, which is probably what they should have been, actually, by the way. Um, so these then are the infantry that are going to meet the German army uh, on the uh, sort of uh, the ridges and uh, valleys of the Somme. Um, now, the, the the tactical instructions for the infantry issued by 4th Army headquarters were, were, were quite controversial and people make, will make, they'll go, oh, I've analysed the war diaries and, the, you know, well, for a start, war diaries aren't entirely accurate. What, what you say you're doing isn't necessarily what you're doing. But 
what what is the basic pro program they've got? Well, uh, they're going to advance at a steady walking pace in long lines of men, just two or three yards apart. Each, you know, uh, th this this would ensure that relatively untrained troops wouldn't lose their alignment and would arrive at the German line at roughly or exactly rather the same time. Um, they would, uh, so that the men in each line are two or three yards apart. The waves are uh, about a hundred yards or so separated um, and if there was a sort of hold up they hoped that each wave would arrive and build up the uh, weight of the assault to overcome whatever obstacle uh, and get them back onto a sort of timetable now this is not really how it works uh, either in theory or practice and uh, this is uh, th this is not a good thing to do uh, the first wave wasn't meant to mop up the German front line. It would keep going. Uh, the following waves would mop up and then push on behind the first wave. Later on, the, there was a leapfrogging thing. So the first wave were... But all oh, this is not, not great. Now, let's what, not forget that the men are going to have to carry everything with them that they might need on the first two days to allow them to properly consolidate their imagined gains. Now, you know, as, as we'll come on to, this is a considerable undertaking in that the weight of all their kit and equipment, 66 pounds of weight. And that's the least. That's if you're not given a pickaxe or a shovel or something else, a machine gun, uh, sorry, Lewis gun drums or something to carry. Yeah, and now that's inevitably going to restrict the mobility and speed of the men across any sort of unbroken ground. You can't run easily with that sort of weight. You can't run at all, really. Uh, so so uh, now this is often people don't understand. Why do they take this? <laughs> I think the clue is, why do they take this essential equipment <laughs> across no man's land with them? Well, why, Gary? Why do they take essential equipment with them why because it's essential Pete. so why couldn't they leave their rifle or, or some machine gun uh, lewis gun drums why couldn't they leave their uh, their rations their hard rations or their bombs behind why couldn't they leave the pickaxes behind well because you couldn't very well say to the very well-trained german army uh, could you just hang on a minute i've got to nip back and get my pickaxe handle <laughs> <laughs> and people don't understand. And, and by the way, um, of course, we've learnt a lot. We've learnt. We've learnt. Uh, about how much was the weight carried by uh, uh, British infantry in the Second World War indeed now? Well, it's a similar amount of weight. In fact, if not more again, about yeah. 80. It comes. I mean, with extra equipment, which almost every infantry ends up carrying something extra, it's about 80 pounds. I don't think they call them pounds anymore. No, I mean, the weight distribution's probably better in the modern uh, army. The, the but First World War kit... Uh, the, the the webbing was really well balanced. It's a lovely bit of kit. It may be better now, but it was as good as you can imagine then, and better than the Germans or the French kit. Uh, I've I've listened to Taff Gillingham. Oh, he knows you know. He was there. Ow. <laughs> so um so uh, so in in essence, this is this restricts speed now. This is the whole thing is controversial because some people insist that oh the infantry just plodded across and and, and then but actually that the fourth army tactical instructions that we've discussed they're only a guidance and it's not what everybody did is it there are variations yeah they it, it, they develop their own subtle variation but for the most part there's a fair degree of uniformity because. Uh, all along the British line, because they have got the same, if you'll pardon the expression, raw recruits. Um, more complex tactics of small columns, advanced infiltration patrols, and the use of lightly equipped parties are meant to race ahead across no man's land to surprise the Germans right on the heels of the barrage were largely, but not entirely, absent. So people are thinking, and some people are innovating, but... Uh for the most part, it is that the picture is not uh, not too sophisticated overall, is it? No. Um, now, there's another job for the infantry. Another job that do you know what I think some soldiers might have moaned about? What's no, that? no. You, I mean, they were working parties, and they're they're all kept busy. You're saying they didn't moan about? No, working they would never moan. British soldiers never moan. True. They never grumble either. They never grumble. And working parties are kept busy in the front lines building headquarters dugouts to uh, oh, uh, all the way through trenches. to assembly trenches yeah. for the attracting, tr attacking Attra troops. Attra attractive. <laughs> Seeing as you're getting at me. To <laughs> for the attractive troops, yeah. Attra the existing yeah. front line couldn't possibly contain all the men that would be needed so for the attack. Do? What do they do? What do they do? What do they do? Uh, so they're, they're having to dig extra trenches. Assembly series, trenches. Yeah, did a series of extra, extra trenches uh, uh, to shelter them before they go over the top. 
Now the next uh, the next uh, portion of it, uh, of we're going to talk about is, is not long because we've got not not a lot to say. But the one thing we want to say about it is important. So cavalry. What do we want to say about cavalry? Why do we not criticise Haig for insisting that there is an option of a cavalry follow up behind the infantry should they break through? Well, what was the alternative? It's the only means that he has of rapid exploitation and pursuit in 1916. He's got no other way of doing it. So he's planning, if they are required, which, frankly, is entirely sensible, uh, but it's it's led to a great deal of uh, a comment from people that you have called in the past terminally stupid, Pete. I wanted you to say. I know, that's why I said that you have. (laughs) Well, no, it's true because people just just don't understand. There is nothing else. There's no... Tanks are... Tanks are slower moving than... uh, Three, four mile per hour? Uh, (laughs) At best. There are no whippets and whippets aren't much faster. Uh, Tanks are unreliable. They break down. There is no faster thing than the cavalry. So it's just an option. Um... Option two, I would like to describe it as. <laughs> uh, no. uh, so, so that's the ca- we, that's all we're going to say about the cavalry. Obviously, uh, but I would say uh, by having them behind the front, ready to be used, that that what, what what does that mean that you have to get a lot of? A lot. Of, sorry, get a lot of what? A lot of fodder up. They 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 do. We mentioned they eat their own weight in, and uh, they, well, that you eat your own weight, but horses. Need- I've often been called fodder. Yeah, cannon fodder. <laughs> oh, moving swiftly on, that's rather <laughs> rather opportune. We're going to talk about <laughs> artillery now because books about the Somme have, have deliberately downplayed what we have both said on a number of occasions is the most important element of weaponry of the British Army. Now, this then, is... Then, yeah. Now, I, I want to, to, to give you an example of this, and I'm not knocking the book because I like it. I like the man who wrote it, uh, although he's a miserable bugger. But then... <laughs> Martin Middlebrook, he's a cracky bloke. Uh, Martin Middlebrook, first day of the Somme, barely mentions artillery. Why is that, Gary? Well, because it doesn't fit with this um, neo-romantic picture of helpless suffering amongst the, the, the victim infantry. And that's not something we go along. We don't conceive of them as uh, helpless victims. No, the, the artillery lays at the centre of the Battle of the Somme, which was always destined to be a gunner's battle right from the start. Yeah, uh, now, did they have the right tools uh, for, for the task at hand? Well, let's go through them. I'll start the 18-pounder, uh, the workhorse of the British artillery. Now, that had come out of our experiences in the um, Boer War, hadn't That's it? right. They wanted a fairly mobile gun, but quick firing. And it's uh, it's a reliable weapon. It's quick firing, as, as you said. Fires a shell. Guess how much a shell weighs from Four. the 18-pounder? 15 pounds? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> or is it 18 pounds? It's just over <laughs> apparently i didn't know that but apparently. um what uh, what's its what's its fault as a weapon well as i mentioned it's come out of the experience of the boer war which was a war of movement so so it's got a limited range of, of, of around about 6500 yards although it could be raised to 7,800 yards by digging in the gun now tower. can does that mean it's got a range of 6,500 yards or behind the german front line no why not? Don't we have the guns in our front line? Well, no, <laughs> that would be fairly silly, wouldn't it? Um, so they're two, three, four thousand yards our side. Yeah, which means what's the effective range? Well, a couple of thousand yards at best. At best, which means can it cover the German second line system? No, it can't. It can only cover the first line system. This that we discussed this didn't we, in the planning? Because that's the huge question. Do they try and get the second line as well? So what else have they got? Well, they've got the uh, the other field artillery gun that's worth mentioning. There are 15 pounders, but the one that really is worth mentioning is the 4.5 inch howitzer. Uh, cracking gun. Uh, well, is the shell 4.5 inch weight? Uh, no, it's a 35 pound shell, uh, which it fires up to 6,600 yards. Now, the, the point about the howitzer is that it's an entirely different looping trajectory. So that's up and then down. Like a mortar. Like a mortar. Uh, so uh, I'm getting that this also can only reach 2,000 yards beyond the German line. At most, by the way, at most. Yeah, because again, it's it's not 
in your front line trench, that would not. So, what be about sensible. medium and heavy artillery? What, 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 well, it's what, scarce in 1914. Scarce, as in almost non-existent. Yeah, it's, but there'd been a great expansion in the uh, the siege batteries of the Royal Garrison artillery. Now, the weapons varied, but the key type amongst the guns was the 60 pounder gun, which hurled their shell up to 10,500 yards. So that's a seven or eight, six, seven, eight thousand yards behind, and that could reach the German second line system. Not not second line, second line system, yeah. Yeah, and the bulk of the howitzers are a six inch or 9.2 inch type. Yeah, we interviewed uh, uh, Montague Cleave, and he was uh, with a Royal Garrison Artillery Battery. Uh, uh, and that, that that was very, remember, that was way back. Uh, we, did, we did a podcast about him. Uh, now, uh, what were they firing, the artillery? Well, the field artillery often find shrapnel, aren't they? Well, what, what's, what's shrapnel for? Well, it's lethal if, if uh, you, you catch the egg. Uh, enemy infantry advancing across open ground. But uh, it's soon found that uh, infantry in trenches are, are relatively safe from uh, the effects of shrapnel. High explosive shells with uh, direct action fuses which exploded only on impact were required to blast them out of uh, their burrows, but these are initially in short supply. Yeah, and they don't have the 106 fuse yet, which is an instantaneous explosion, which is a 1917 development. Again, you can't have something that hasn't been invented. No, um, no. So shrapnel shells. Um, now shrapnel can be part of a creeping barrage, but creeping barrel because that keeps your head down. I mean, if infantry in the, are in the trenches firing at house, they'll get hit by shrapnel shells. But they're not really creeping barrages. Aren't really. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, what are they mainly used for? Well, they're mainly used now uh, for uh, cutting uh, the barbed wire. Now, now this, we, that's we not what they're designed to do. But they had discovered in planning for Nerve Chapelle that 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 was the most effective way of doing it because high explosive, high explosive just threw it up in the air and it came back down again, largely uh, still as a, 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 a in one piece piece of barbed so wire. So shrapnel for barbed wire cutting is not stupid. It's the word what... I was struggling for there, Pete, was obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> it's a difficult word for yeah. a young boy in his prime. Um, so, uh, so shrapnel shells, it, they're not stupid to use them that way, but it isn't that effective. One thing that's important is that you have to have a, a skilled gunner to get the, to time the fuse so that the shell explodes just above the barbed wire. Uh, were the gunners of the massively increased and enlarged Royal Artillery all skillful? Yes. No, it would have been the correct answer. But yes, is another answer. I've been asked by the listeners to be more positive in my approach to Gary's blunders. <laughs> so I'm sure you might have been right if you had. So been how wrong. many guns have they got then, Pete? <laughs> well, <laughs> changing the subject swiftly. <laughs> I reckon we had about, oh, I, I, can't, I hate statistics, and I, I would say 1,500, 1,537 1, 1, guns and howitzers. It works out, oh no, you'll have to work it out. Well, it's uh, one field gun to every 20 yards of front and one heavy gun to every 58 yards of front. How does that compare to Nerve Chappelle? Well, Nerve si- Chappelle was one every six yards, I think it was. That's interesting. So this big bombardment, given that they have to cover more lines, we, we mentioned all this in the planning business, it's not, not that good. Now, the artillery plans, they're prepared by 4th Army and laid down the general tasks to be achieved by the guns uh, under the subordinate core, the control of the core. So the, the core, each core would plan, plan its own six-day bombardment. You know, they're the ones... Uh, the corps and divisional commanders would 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 sort out the barrage. Um, what are the tasks of the guns? Let's just sum it up. Well, to put it really simply, and this is an oversimplification, oh, Peter. Probably just as well. The guns are there to clear away the German barbed wire defences, smash their lines of fortifications, and destroy the German artillery batteries. Now, th- this is a problem because... The, the German artillery are a severe threat, and actually they're the ones that really kill you in no man's land, in your trenches before you go, all these things. Um, so you need to make special arrangements for counter-battery fire. What's the problem with counter-battery fire when most of your guns are still field artillery? Well, only the heavier guns and howitzers have got the long range that's necessary, as we mentioned earlier, to reach the German gun lines. Because the German gun lines are two or 3,000 lines behind, which is more than the we can reach. Yeah, that that's, that's a problem. So the, each core allots a certain number of heavy and medium batteries to the task. However, what's the problem with this? 
Well, you... unfortunately, amongst the many other priorities that fought for their attention, it's inevitable that sometimes there's simply not enough guns to go round. There's just not an understanding at this time how crucial counter-battery fire is. And, and they've got other tasks to do. Batteries are double tasked, triple tasked, quadruple tasked, and they don't always prioritise the, the, the... In fact, they don't. Uh, the, the, the Royal Flying Corps may tell them where they are, the German batteries, but uh, and it may help them with artillery observation. But, but there's another problem. What, what's the other problem about hitting a, a German battery? Well, of it's four... got to be pinpoint accuracy, and as you mentioned, it's, it's often beyond the raw gunners that, that we've got in 1916. Now, how, well, how is, what format is the barrage going to take? Well, they're going to give uh, much thought to the question of the, the manner of movement of the barrage line of, of exploding cells actually during the, the assault. So, in general, it was considered that this should sort of lift directly to the next German line of trenches when the British infantry emerged from their trenches and set off across no man's land. So, this would mean that the moment you get out of your trench... The barrage moves on. So moves off the German front lines. Yeah, onto the next line. And therefore the German uh, uh, defenders can come out and fire un, uh, unbothered. Unfettered. Unfettered! <laughs> yeah, they can. And just at the point that the infantry are slowly walking across no man's land. So this is this, this is this is uh, not a good idea. Um, now what, there is an emerging interest, which I mean, people always say, "Oh, well, Canadians invented, the Australians invented, area." The French almost certainly invented the creeping barrage, but the British did, were to perfect it. Had they perfected it on the first of July by the first of July, nineteen sixteen? No, I mean, there's an emerging interest in, in the new theories um, introducing Creeping Barrage, which basically... Uh, you better, can you explain it for me? Yeah, the Creeping Barrage would start in no man's land and it would move up to and over the German front line, covering and carrying with it the attacking infantry. Now, they'd have to be really close behind. Now, this form of barrage had become the fulcrum of British attacks for the next two years. But so at that the idea point, is... There's a line of shells between the infantry moving forward, yeah. just in front of them, so that the Germans can't, that they're not, they are bothered, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and, and you know, these, these are early days, and, early and, and days many of the gunners are worried about the daunting task of preparing and firing accurately such a barrage. The infantry themselves, they didn't really see the point, and certainly many divisional and brigade commanders didn't understand why the barrage had to start in front of the German lines. And move forward. Funnily enough, I remember doing a documentary on, 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 on the Somme, and, and the uh, the people, uh, the, the, the film producers, couldn't understand. They thought we'd got it wrong. It would start on the German line, but that now starts and moves towards, i.e. threatening the infantry and for, for forcing them to keep their head down, then over... And then just behind it come the infantry. Yeah. Uh, now, the end result of all this was that most corps commanders preferred to stick with what they knew. Which, so they don't use it. So they don't barrage. use it. Uh, so they use this other barrage, which is clearly not right. Now, I want to make it clear. There are, I mean, for instance, other countries carry on with this sort of approach. But the British abandon uh, and move to the creeping barrage during the Somme later on. But these are early days, as we said before. So... Uh, preliminary bombardment, that's going to be, what, six, I can't remember, it's five or six, six, seven days, can't remember already. Well, it's, it's planned gonna, for six days. That's right. And it's, oh, it gets extended because of bad weather. Um, and it builds to a crescendo uh, in, in the sort of lead up to zero hour. And, and, and then it would lift and drop onto the, the next German trench, as you described. That's what, uh, and there's some places, uh, very few places. Now, the infantry, what, what the, sometimes they'd have crept out into no man's land, wouldn't they? About 100 yards from the back of that barrage this is not a creeping barrage it's just a standard barrage um, and then they'd move forward to take the German front line uh, this time of course our barrage is battering the next line and then they gather again and move forward and it would be a staged progress it wouldn't be for long before they run out of range would it no, and it's intended that the process would just be repeated over and over again several times in accordance with the timetable. Seems optimistic to me. Well, it doesn't allow for any hold-ups or, or any sort of general confusion of war. It's it's based on the belief expressed by both Haig and Rawlinson that the bombardment would sweep everything before it and that the infantry would be faced with minimal opposition. So they were wrong. 
And I have no problem with that. I have no problem with admitting that they were wrong about that. Now, the infantry are watching the guns coming forward. Now, this is their... This, they're pleased because this is what's going to make it easier, save their lives. Uh, their, their, their survival depends on it. And this is a, a favourite of ours, uh, Gary, Captain Charles May, 22nd Manchester Regiment. Uh, what does he say? The face of the earth is changed up there, has changed within the last seven days. It is now honeycombed with gun emplacements. Guns are everywhere. Guns of all calibres, some 9.2s were registering on Mamets whilst we were watching. They are terrible shells and simply knock lumps out of the village. There are 9.2s, 8-inch, 6-inch, 4.7s, 4.5s, 18-pounders and 13-pounders. All sorts and conditions, all bristling out of the ground, ready to belch forth a regular tornado of fire. As Worthy said when he saw it, Fritz, you're for it. It's a sentiment I quite agree with. Ammunition is pouring up. That for the heavies by motor transport. That for the lighter fry by wagon and limber. Two convoys of the latter, each of them fully 500 yards in length, passed the Bois at sundown. It was a great sight. It is marvellous, this marshalling of power, this concentrated effort of our great nation <laughs> put forward to the end of destroying our foe. The greatest battle in the world is on the eve of breaking. Please God, it may terminate successfully for us. Fritz, I think, knows all about it. At any rate, a day or two, he put the following notice on his wire opposite the 4th Division. When your bombardment starts, we are going to bugger off back five miles. Kitchener is buggered, Esquith is buggered, you're buggered, we're buggered. Let's all bugger off home. So the, the Germans were posh British officers? Yeah. <laughs> been... I absolutely love that quote. <laughs> yes, it, I mean, it's brilliant. Now, um... Ammunition shortages, they've gone, haven't they? Uh, this is well, part largely. of the, the, the Empire's put its shoulder to the wheel, if you like, and, uh, and uh, the, the figures are unbelievable. And remember, everyone has to be brought forward. So every 18 pounder gun's got 200 rounds a day for the six days of the bombardment. That, that works out at 1,200 rounds, Gary. I've been doing some maths remedial work recently. Um, oh. How many for six guns? Uh, uh, six times twelve hundred is uh, <laughs> seven thousand two hundred rounds for a six gun battery. I knew that. I was just joking. Now they all worked perfectly, of course. All these uh, uh, manufactured uh, oh, ammunition, yeah. didn't they? So lots more ammunition, but there's a a, a lot a, a diminution in uh, quality. Uh, so they're not as good as previously, and some of them don't go bang. Uh, what is the point of an artillery shell? To go bang. So this is a problem. the The percentage of duds, as they were called, could be could be very high. I'm not going to put a statistic on it. Let's just go with could be high. Now, uh, 24th one, of one, June, two, three lots. That's it. That's precisely it. <laughs> um, so 24th of June, the great bombardment begins. Gary, uh, uh, row, boom, boom, bang, boom, bang, a bang. Um, and this is uh, who am I going to be? Uh, you're going to be Captain Cuthbert Lawson of the 369th Battery, 15th Brigade, Royal Horse Artillery. Uh, this always reminds me of the Spike Milligan joke. I'm a getting on out of it. <laughs> I'm a getting started today and we're right in the thick of it. I am now living in my damp hedge. He's a forward observation officer. And there is such a row going on, I absolutely can't hear myself think. Day and night, and all day and all night, guns and nothing but guns, and the shattering clang of bursting high explosives. This is the great offensive, the long looked for big posh, and the whole course of the war will be settled in the next ten days. <laughs> Some time to be living in. It's quite funny to think that in London, life's going on just as usual, and no one even knows this show has started. While out here, at least seven different kinds of hell are rampant. Although there is a suggestion that the guns could be heard in London. Bollocks. Well. <laughs> Those suggestions are rampant. <laughs> a, hang on. Rampant <laughs> suggestions. I'm not going there. <laughs> let's, let's move on. The barrage continues without any sign of let up. And if anything... The British seem to bring more guns into action. Boom, bang, a bang, boom, bang, which increases bang. the fire rate. Increases the fire rate, concentrating on pouring 
ever more shells to break down the German resistance. Now, let's hear from Charles May again. Captain Charles May, 22nd uh, Manchester Regiment. What does he say this time? Up on the top, watching the bombardment over La Boiselle, Fricourt and Mametz. The speeding up has commenced. The hillsides over there are under a haze of smoke already. Shells, which bursting, throw up clouds, white puffs, black puffs, brown puffs and grey. Puffs which start as small downy balls and spread sideways and upwards till they dwarf the woods. Darts of flame and smoke, black smoke, these last which shoots high and into the air like a giant poplar tree. These are the HE heavy explosives. The shooting was magnificent. Time and time again, the explosions occurred right in the Hun trenches. By Mamet's wood, an ammunition dump must have been struck. The resultant smoke column was enormous. Mamet's itself one cannot see. It is shrouded in a multicoloured pall of smoke all of its own. It must be awfully rotten for the Huns holding the line, yet one feels no sympathy for them. Too long they have been able to strafe our devoted infantry like this and without hindrance or answer from us. What is source for the English goose is surely source for the German gander. And may his stomach relish it. <laughs> oh, now, uh, nobody's ever seen anything like this in the British Army. And, uh, uh, and uh, it seems the Germans are doomed. It's not a su- surprise that commanders think that they're going to get through. This is Lieutenant William Bloor again, Sea Battery, 149th Brigade, Royal Field Artillery. It was a sight to see the hostile trenches. The whole countryside was just one mass of flame, smoke and earth thrown up sky high. About 5,000 shells per diem are pitching on a front of about 500 yards. Whilst observing, I could not resist feeling sorry for the wretched atoms of humanity crouching behind their ruined parapets and going through hell itself. Modern war is the most cruel thing I have heard of and the awful ordeal of these Poor devils, even though they are Bosches, must be impossible Boshes? to describe. Bosch. Bosches. <laughs> I want to call they them were, bo- They were Bosches. <laughs> Boshy, Bosch, Bosch. Impossible to describe indeed. Indeed, although he just describes it. <laughs> Uh, now, the, the moment's approaching for the attack. Every corps, every division, every brigade, they're all assigned their exact place in the battle line. They've all prepared their own plans tailored to the exact local situation. All this, more staff work, more. Is this staff work important? Yeah, you've mentioned it on a number of, of occasions. You know, mistakes in staff work cost lives, Pete. Yeah. So the, the the orders are passed around all around the infantry. Young officers, they're trying to assimilate all the mass of detail they've got to learn. They've, they've got to commit the, the layout of the ground, the layout of the German defences to memory. They've got to assess the probability or otherwise of success. Now, most of them are optimistic, aren't they? They're, 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 and why? We Well, we know why. Why? Well, why, well, Gary? Why? Well, they're looking at the masses of shells that are falling on the German lines and, and, and they seem that there's every chance of a relatively painless success. Nothing could possibly survive that. What could go wrong? Now, it's not funny, by the way, because we know no. this is the greatest tragedy about to unfurl. Unfurl. Uh, so I shouldn't be so light there. Now, the army c- commanders, they, they can't do much to impact on what's happening now. Um, what would happen if they tried? You, you be, I mean, uh, again, your experience with a gigantic corporation. What happens if you try and change your plan at the last minute? Well, you can't because... the the Right, the attack can't be cancelled. You can't change the plans now. Mistakes can't any longer be rectified without making the situation far worse. It's now down to the ordinary soldiers to go over the top and they've got to overcome whatever lays before them. And, and we feel very sorry for them for that. Now, Haig and his generals, they've fashioned their plans to, to the very best of their ability uh, and hamstrung by various things like the levels of training, all that, uh, that, 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 that all that. But it, it's, it's an enormous responsibility that, 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 you know, as they're lying hopefully alone in their beds at night, uh, they must, it must have borne down on them. Uh, but they choose to be optimistic. And this is, uh, you're going to read a last quote from Haig now, uh, General Sir Douglas Haig, GHQ. The weather report is favourable for tomorrow. With God's help, I feel hopeful for tomorrow. The men are in splendid spirits. 
Several have said that they have never before been so instructed and informed of the nature of the operation before them. The wire has never been so well cut, nor the artillery pre preparation so thorough. I have seen personally all the corps commanders, and one or all are full of confidence. Now, uh, this is this is uh, uh, the, the the night before a tragedy, so we're we're not going to have our usual levity at the end. Uh, we we all know what's going to happen, uh, but I think I hope we've tried to explain why that we went into battle as we did and the background to the 1st of July. The next episode we're going to do will be uh, uh, the, the, on, on the Somme, will be uh, broadcast around about the 1st of July. It's, it's a calamity. It's a disaster. Thanks for, for, uh, thanks for taking us through it, Gary. Thank you, Pete. And uh, I'm so sorry you struggled with your words today. I've had a lot of problems. Cheers, Pete. <laughs>